everybody. Um, my name is Katie Wilson. I'm a lead design researcher at Superbloom. And my talk today is about the creation of our set of resources that we call a UX toolbox for usability, accessibility, and security um, for use in open source projects. Um, it is a set of resources that aims to bridge these three aspects as core concepts. Um, and it's really great that we heard from Scott and Jan to kind of give us, set the stage of a lot of the issues that designers in particular face in contributing to OSS projects. And I hope that this talk can be, um, give a bit of uh, practical advice of how we might be able to implement some UX practices related to usability, security, and accessibility, um, not only for designers, but for product managers, researchers, um, and other designers um, in this space. So just to introduce Superbloom, um, we were formerly known as Simply Secure, if that name rings a bell, but we're a nonprofit design and research organization working on a lot of open source projects in the digital rights and internet freedom ecosystem. Um, and the reason we worked on this toolbox is that um, a large focus area for us is working against the lack of resources, particularly for designers um, in the public interest technology and open source spaces. Um, and so we're really looking to identify unmet needs, design for access, and extend the impact of newly built tools and interventions. Um, so we're trying to focus on not just the technology, but the processes that form and create it, um, which is why this project was quite core to what we do. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the Open Tech Fund for supporting this project, um, and also extend a very sincere thanks to Accessibility Lab. Um, Nancy is joining us today, um, and she was really instrumental in uh, shaping our approach to accessibility in this project. Um, accessibility Lab is a company that um, seeks to ensure the inclusion of disabled people um, through accessibility in the digital world. Um, so they work with all kinds of organizations, public, private, civil society, to promote and defend digital rights. So um, you may have seen them in the lobby yesterday. Uh, Rashi is also here from Accessibility Lab. So if you need any expert accessibility advice, look no further. So um, what is this toolbox? Um, you can scan this code to access the whole thing if you'd like to look. Um, also, my colleague Errol printed some gorgeous hard copies, so if anyone's interested, I have some of those after the talk. Um, but as I said, it's a collection of tools, resources, and lines of inquiry to help people who build and design technology navigate risks and mitigate potential harms present and emergent in software development. Um, so while we heard um, a lot of maybe the typical aspects of UX you might think of from Scott and Jan, um, this uh, looks at UX as a very holistic process that is concerned with uh, the safety and rights of the users that are interacting with our tools. Um, so we're hoping to kind of uh, illustrate that bridge between these concepts through um, this toolbox and make those interventions, maybe those small bricks that um, people uh, are hoping to uh, inject into their um, project, like Scott was mentioning, um, more uh, doable for people who may not um, already incorporate design and research activities into their project life cycles. Um, so we started this process by attempting to revamp our usable security heuristics evaluation, but felt a little bit too constrained by uh, a simple set of heuristics as um, our only evaluative principles. Um, because we really wanted to emphasize that the challenges faced by software teams require prioritizing user experiences while carefully addressing potential harms and respecting human rights. That's the core of our work. So um, while traditional technical security audits um, serve a very essential uh, purpose, they don't typically focus on the more socio-technical aspects of a tool that might make systems insecure, like its usability, which I'll um, detail a little bit more clearly later on. Um, and then 
on the other side of the coin, accessibility practices and audits often happen in addition to usable security reviews or they don't happen at all um, because accessibility is often treated as an afterthought, which is also something we're trying to work against with um, this set of resources. So broadly, it's an attempt to bridge usability, security, and accessibility through the lens of user experience um, for a kind of holistic and modular approach um, to understanding and mitigating risks within human-centered tool design and development. Um, and so we hope that this can be useful to all kinds of roles within our ecosystem. Um, as I said, not only designers, but other tool contributors as well. Um, and I just want to mention some of the limitations here. Um, it's certainly not a cure-all solution for these three aspects. Um, it does not detail a full or typical design thinking process or offer a full set of research and design activities that ought to take place throughout a product development cycle. Um, and they cannot, uh, as I mentioned, replace something like a technical security audit um, or a security design review. Um, or for that matter, an expert accessibility audit. Um, and then kind of lastly, as UX practitioners, we always like to caution that, uh, you know, simple heuristics, tools, and guidelines can never replace user input. Um, so the only way to get ahead of surprise issues is to test your tools with real and diverse sets of users early and often. Um, but we hope, as I said, that these can offer, um, as this can be an offering of more easily usable interventions um, into the design realm within your project. Um, and again, this is a work in progress, so um, we're eagerly looking for feedback and um, looking to iterate upon this offering. So if you have any ideas or questions, I would love to hear about them. Um, so I just want to mention kind of where some of the inspiration for this work came from. Um, as UX practitioners, uh, we assume a level of responsibility for approaching technology, not as, as I said, a static product, but as a process that affects many people. Um, and to us, that responsibility really intersects with the effectiveness of the technology. So to have a truly effective software product, as well as a responsible one, um, we believe it must consider and prioritize these three aspects. And the costs are high and important. Um, for example, lacking usable security means that in the worst case, um, users might find ways around usability issues, which could inadvertently increase their risk for a variety of reasons. For example, by choosing the wrong settings and sharing data unsafely or revealing more of their identity than they intended to um, by not being able to safely navigate the options available to them. Um, and as I mentioned, um, accessibility is often relegated as an afterthought, um, which inherently excludes large swaths of people from their right to digital tools and information. Um, so we're trying to work against that trend. So um, in this are kind of these foundational ideas about the synergy between these three core concepts. Um, as I mentioned, we believe that the security and accessibility of your product are critical aspects of usability. So if your software is not accessible, it is not truly usable. If your software is not secure, it is not truly usable. And if your software is not usable, it's not truly effective. Um, and secondly, uh, sometimes there are these kind of false dichotomies that arise between these areas of intervention. Um, sometimes teams are warned or worried that accessibility, for example, might come at the cost of security or usability. So we want to emphasize that these concepts are actually very mutually beneficial, dependent on one another, and non-competing. Um, and uh, I think as Scott mentioned, the kind of hill we might need to go down to rise to a, to a higher plane. <laughs> we want to emphasize that the benefits greatly outweigh the perceived and real costs of investing in some of these things. Not only does usability, accessibility, and security improve trust, increase usership, and legitimacy of your product, but um, considering these aspects from as early as possible in the development cycle saves teams a lot of time and energy refactoring when these problems inevitably arise later on. Um, and just to mention why UX is related to risk, um, I want to just 
offer that UX design and research methods um, not only help to clarify, understand, and empathize with the potential challenges users might face when interacting with a tool, but they can also play a key role in anticipating, planning for, and alleviating potential risk. So a lot of these offerings are about um, kind of that planning step that um, Scott was referring to earlier if you were here. Um, and we understand risk as a broad concept, so though we work on a lot of human rights tools, um, you know, risk is not only relevant to human rights tools. Um, all kinds of projects can have potential contributing factors that require risk to be mitigated um, from things like sensitive user data and uh, vulnerable populations as a large user group to potentially harmful stimuli on the interface um, and intrusive research methods during the design process. So, um, that brings me to the toolbox itself, which is made up of three parts. Knowing your users and yourself, assessing risks and threats, and our usability and accessibility heuristic review. So each section includes introductory text, kind of introducing key concepts and lines of inquiry, and then is followed by a collection of resources, suggested activities, or replicable templates that your team can pull from depending on your project's needs. So the first section of part one is about positionality, bias, and cultural context. The driving question being, how can we proactively identify our own biases and gaps stemming from our, cult our team culture and our uh, personal positionality? Um, so here we really want to emphasize that um, and acknowledge that our team our teams um, employing these concepts um, may, may encounter gaps in themselves and the people they work with stemming from their cultural viewpoints. Um, so this offers you know, a step towards interrogating our own positionality and potential biases, um, which you know, if we hope to mitigate systemic harms, we really need to put in the work in our own teams and in ourselves um, to stop that from uh, multiplying into a, a larger issues, which is how we get a lot of bias uh, designed into the technology that we interact with on a daily basis. Um, so some examples of what's included here, we have, a, for example, a positionality worksheet that guides the reader through a series of questions to reflect upon their relationship to the subject matter, the technology, the user groups. Um, and to identify how they're approaching the work and what assumptions they might be bringing with them. Um, another example is a set of ability prompt cards that raise awareness about potential accessibility challenges that users might face, but also, again, help to kind of understand what assumptions and ideas um, may be leaving potential users behind. Um, and the second section of this part is about identifying and familiarizing yourself with users, which is you know, at the heart of what we as UX researchers and designers um, do. And so the question here is, how can we rigorously understand the perspective of all potential segments of our users, not even just the intended users? Um, so of course, this is a foundational step in UX and design work. But here, we want to really highlight the relationship between user understanding um, and evaluation of risk in particular. So um, it's important for software teams to develop a clear picture of who the target users are, because otherwise, there's no standpoint from which to evaluate risk. So some examples here. If you've ever been involved in a UX process, you've likely seen or created user personas. If you haven't, user personas are sample identities that can stand in for the needs of larger groups of users. Um, and so while this is always a valuable exercise, it can be particularly useful um, to think through user needs, threats, and potential vulnerabilities. Um, and another uh, offering in this section is about engaging with community boards and channels. So one of the secret um, benefits of open source, not so secret actually, but for UX in particular in open source is that um, projects often have the great advantage of having 
engaged contributors and users gathering in one place, um, either on GitHub or on other channels. If anyone was at Ruth's conversation yesterday about governance, um, she really showed how we can use things like forums to our advantage and really use them as kind of ad hoc user research repositories. So um, we like to encourage people if they don't feel like they have time or budget to do um, user interviews, for example, to um, spend some time reading the forums, see what um, usability issues are coming up there. Um, then part two is about assessing threats and risks. What vulnerabilities are there that might increase, increase the risks to either users or stakeholders? Um, so from that place of groundedness in our uh, understanding of ourselves and our users, we can take um, our comprehension of risks from concept to assessment and action. Um, so it focuses this section on lines of inquiry and resources for doing threat modeling and risk assessment in projects and with project teams. Um, so for example, some resources available here are um, a kind of pre-populated set of personas that we call personas non grata um, that represent 10 potential malicious actors, um, which helps you kind of like design for resilience in your product if those kinds of actors find their way in. Um, another example is a workshop template that we call Anxiety Games. Um, and it's kind of a gamified, interactive way to build different threat and risk scenarios that your users might face, and then determine how your team could respond proactively to them or reactively to them. Um, so I used this activity in 2021 with an open source team that builds community mapping software in rural areas in South America. And at that point, uh, it was really difficult to travel um, during that stage of the pandemic. Um, and there wasn't an opportunity to engage directly with users to get new user research into the hands of the um, program and tech team. So we used this strategy instead to surface kind of that latent user um, knowledge that the program and tech teams had. Um, to uh, plan for and prioritize what um, security interventions they really needed to focus on, um, which ended up being about device seizure scenarios because they were building a mobile app um, in places with rep repressive um, regimes and um, uh, their, their users had ran the risk of, while using the mapping software, having their phone seized um, and then having to deal with what, what do they do with this documentation that they've been collecting through this app. So that was what we then decided to focus our UX design work on. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we tried to revamp our usable security heuristics evaluation to incorporate accessibility. Um, and so our aim here is to combine the best practices of a usability heuristic evaluation with an accessibility self-audit while keeping privacy and security top of mind. So it is a, a tall order, and this is a place that we would really love some uh, feedback. Um, and we want to empower tool teams to take some of these design steps proactively, um, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so this incorporates some industry standard heuristics from Nielsen Norman, as well as relevant security related recommendations from some work we did with the Web Foundation and the Tech Policy Design Lab, um, working against deceptive designs. And then Accessibility Lab um, worked with us to adapt their expert audit procedure into this kind of self-guided review. Um, and then throughout, we've linked the relevant web content accessibility guidelines, which are the standard of compliance for accessibility online. So just quickly, what this looks like in practice, and I have hard copies of this as well, is that each section has a guiding heuristic, um, which we're calling principles for responsible interface design. Um, so for example, the first one is wayfinding and visibility. A system should always keep users informed about what's going on through appropriate feedback in reasonable time. And then there are a set of tips for evaluating that heuristic um, relevant to what 
privacy and security issues might arise for a user um, given an interface with this question. Um, so one example is to avoid misleading cues that lead users to make false assumptions about the choices they're making on the interface. And then lastly, we have related accessibility guidelines to follow per each heuristic. So one example is always provide alternative text to images when possible, and then we have um, linked the uh, accessibility guidelines so people can refer to them easily. Um, so just to wrap up, we really want to um, emphasize here that all of these factors, accessibility, security, and usability, are key components of good UX and therefore key components of good software. Software is made by and for human beings, um, and we hope that this set of tools can help teams use your understanding of yourselves and your users to design software that's more effective and rights respecting. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Katie. We have uh, still time for a few questions, so. Thank you very much for your talk. There was a lot of effort put into it. Really appreciate that. Um, I've personally also built a toolkit for the open source ecosystem, so a UX research toolkit. And um, I built that last year, and now I'm moving into the phase of actually going out into the um, Bitcoin open source ecosystem mm -hmm. and you know, uh, working hands-on with projects and using that toolkit. How has it been for you as a team? Um, you know, I know it's one thing to build something, but actually using it is a very different thing. And how, what has been your experience with um, you know, um, using your toolkit with teams, is that something that you do or is it that the teams use it on their own and come back to you with feedback? Mm -hmm. What's been the most valuable for you um, with, on, uh, that's the second question, is ensuring that your toolkit is, is actually usable for the people that you've built yeah, it for? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's yeah, the question. <laughs> that's, that's definitely um, been the focus of our hopefully next phase of work here. Um, I think there are a lot of considerations like a, I didn't have time to go over them, but here um, we have a lot of uh, questions about the usability of the format of the tools um, and especially how uh, teams can kind of guide themselves through these questions, especially if they don't have UX research backgrounds and kind of prioritize um, different uh, approaches on their own. Um, so something we heard when um, some colleagues of mine tested this at a different conference with um, uh, a set of developers was that people want um, to know how much time an individual activity will take um, so that they can really evaluate what, what's the investment here and can I commit to it. Um, and also just more case studies about how these tools are actually used in projects in particular. So that is hopefully what we will work on developing. But to answer your first question, um, we haven't used it with tools too much yet because we just published it recently. but. Um, uh, so far, my experience has been that um, teams will look, look it over and certain things will jump out to them as particularly relevant to the questions that they're asking themselves. And then we've discussed use. But um, yeah, that question of like, how can people really stand on their own and, and take these things forward is definitely something we're <laughs> looking at still. And I'd love to review your toolkit as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Big round of applause for Katie.